preparing for today's message has been was really challenging for a number of reasons. And um, as you, many of you know, we've been going through the book of, uh, of Hebrews since January, going through it chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And last week we concluded the letter of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrew church, to the Hebrews. Um, and what I was hoping to do last week, and I didn't get a chance to do it, was to give you a quick review, a, a review of this letter, of some of the big things that we learned throughout the time together that we spent studying this letter. Now, as I said, it's been challenging because so many topics, so many things, so many subjects were covered, and many lessons were also learned, were given to us. And it's hard, it was hard to just condense it in just one short study. And I didn't want to go over each detail of each chapter and let this extend again another few weeks. No, I just wanted to do one quick review, overview of what we learned here. And so, again, the challenge was to get everything together. I don't think I did it justice, but I suggest, I really suggest that you go back, listen to those chapters that I covered, and it will give you more of a, an idea of some of the things I'm going to be mentioning today. Also, another thing to keep, I want you to keep in mind that as we review this letter is that the author of Hebrews was writing to a group of Jewish believers in Christ. Many of them were facing impending threat of persecution and some were turning away from Christ and going back to Judaism. So the author knew that the only way his readers would stand firm, even to the point of death, was to, one, have the proper view of Jesus Christ in all of his glory, and two, understand how Jesus is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament pointed toward. The author wanted those believers to understand that staying focused on the glory of Christ's person and his priesthood would give them the strength to endure any persecution by faith. And yes, I understand and I know that the circumstances today, the situation today, maybe yours is completely different than those early Christians that this writer was writing to. Maybe your circumstances are, are completely different. The fact is this, is that this here letter is as relevant today as it was back then. See, by seeing the glory of Christ in his person and priesthood, it's going to strengthen us to endure trials by faith. The Puritan John Owen wrote, the glory of God comprehends both the holy properties of his nature and the counsels of his will and the light of knowledge of these things we have only in the face or person of Jesus Christ. So you see, my friends, Jesus Christ came to reveal to us God's holy nature and the counsels of his will. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, we read, or the author cited Psalm chapter 40, verse 7, with reference to Jesus. He said this, then I said, then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, God. And so to display God's absolute holiness, his justice and wrath, and punishing all sin, but also his infinite mercy and love in providing the sacrifice that his justice demands, Jesus came to offer himself on the cross in our place. 
in order for his sacrifice to be of value beyond himself, he had to be God. And in order for it to apply to us, he had to be man. Thus, the author of Hebrews began this letter by showing the person of Jesus Christ as God and man. Now, as I go through these chapters, um, I'm going to be going through certain verses. You can follow along if you want to, um, uh, starting from Hebrews chapter 1. Again, just a couple verses, maybe one verse here or there, but um, you can follow along as I read some of the verses there. But before I actually begin, let me uh, do something I should have done in the beginning, and that's pray for this morning's message. Lord God, I thank you again for this morning. I thank you for your word. Um, and so now I pray that it will go out powerfully, whether it's to those that are here listening or those that are watching um, or listening to this message later on. I pray you will move powerfully and speak powerfully, Lord, through your word. And also that this message will, will touch um, those that need to hear it, Lord whether it's the whole thing or whether it's parts of it, Lord, we, I know that you have a, a message here, a, a word here for somebody. Lord, and that's how good you are. That's how powerful you are, Lord. And so, Lord, may we honor you now with this time. Fill this room with your spirit. Keep us safe from any harm. Lord, and... We just forget about all the distractions that will prevent us from really listening to what you have to say at this moment. Bless this time again. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So beginning in Hebrews chapter 1. Actually, Hebrews chapter 1 through 4. Now, in the first four chapters of Hebrews, the writer informed us of how important it is to continually ask God to reveal to us Christ in his glorious person. And right away, in the beginning of chapter 1, he gets right into his subject by showing us that Jesus Christ is God's final revelation to us. In verses 1 through 3, he writes, Long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, again, if you want more details about these verses that I just read, I'm going to have to refer you to the sermon I gave probably back in January when I covered these verses. But I want to share with you something that John Calvin said about these verses, emphasizing that the author's point isn't theological but practical. He said this, his, the author's purpose, was really to build up our faith so that we may learn that God is made known to us in no other way than in Christ. For as to the essence of God, so immense is the brightness that it dazzles our eyes, except it shines on us in Christ. Now, in just these three verses alone, there are seven statements about Jesus. 
Number one, Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. Number two, through him, God made the world. Number three, he is the radiance of God's glory. Number four, he is the exact representation of God's nature. Number five, he upholds all things by the power of his word, by the word of his power. Number six, he has made purification for our sins. And number seven, he now sits at the right hand of the majesty on high. The way I see it, and I hope that you are able to see it too, I find it hard to understand how anyone can read those verses, not to mention the ones immediately following, without concluding that Jesus Christ is God the second person of the Trinity. The author then goes on to show us in verses 4 through 14 that Jesus is greater than the angels in glory. Throughout the Bible, it reveals, contrary to what books and the internet says, that the angels are glorious creatures. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 6, describes his vision of an angel. It says this, His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning, and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like polished bronze, and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. And then this was Daniel's response in verse 8, the following verse, or two verses later. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me. My face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. It completely wiped them out. And this was just a vision. It completely wiped, it, wiped them out that he fell into a deep sleep. And then a few verses after that, we're told that when the angel awakened him, Daniel trembled on his hands and knees. These angels were so glorious, so amazing, that people just fell on their knees. And we see that too. When throughout the New Testament as well, especially when at the resurrection, people were just amazed. So these stories that you hear about angels that you're friends and they can just be somebody, you know, no, the full glory of these angels will just make you want to just fall and tremble on your knees. Yeah, not to be worshipped, but just out of of shock and awe. Now, again, Daniel's vision, that was just an angel. But the author in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6 shows that the Son of God is so superior to the angels that when he brings his firstborn into into the world, he says, and let all God's angels worship him. Jesus came, all the angels, all these glorious angels were now worshiping Jesus. In case we miss the point, the author contrasts, contrasts the angels who serve God as flames of fire with the sun. And in verse, uh, chap- in verse 8 of chapter 1, it says this, But to the sun, he says, your throne, God, is forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. Then, as if it wasn't enough, he goes on in verses 10 through 12 to cite Psalm 102, applying to Jesus what the Old Testament clearly ascribes to God. In the beginning, Lord, you established the earth. 
and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. You will roll them up like a cloak, and they will be changed like clothing. But you are the same, and your years will never end. He clinches it up by asking in verse 13, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? See, my friends, to sit at God's right hand is too great of a privilege for any created being. That honor belongs to the eternal Son, to the eternal Son of God alone. That's His seat. But it's important that as Christians, we not only understand Jesus' deity, but also His perfect humanity. Thus, after a practical exhortation in the beginning of chapter 2, the author continues in uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through, 5 through 18, that Jesus is not only fully God, but also fully human. Here, the author introduces the theme that is prominent later in the book. And that is that Jesus came into the world to suffer and die for our sins. Jesus' death wasn't an accident, nor an unexpected twist of fate that thwarted God's plan. Rather, the death of Jesus fulfilled God's plan to rescue us from the ravages of sin. The author makes the shocking statement in chapter 2, verse 10, For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. By the phrases, for whom and through whom all things exist, the author is saying that God is the first and final cause of all that is, including, including the plan of salvation through the death of his son. And he's showing that God actively governs his creation, working everything in conformity, in conformity with the purpose of his will. So the death of Jesus on our behalf it was fitting. It was fitting because it works for God's glory in accordance with his eternal purpose. It was fitting because it displayed God's perfect attributes of righteousness, justice, power, wisdom, love, and grace. Jesus' death was fitting because it displayed his perfect humanity and it confirmed him as the pioneer of our salvation. Jesus' death also triumphed over Satan and the power of death. And he's now, as verse 18 says there in chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 says, our merciful and faithful high priest who is able to help those who are tempted. Now you'd think that to portray Jesus as fully God, superior to angels, and fully human, who offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, you'd think that that would be enough. But the author was writing to Jews who regarded Moses as the greatest man who ever lived. And so in chapter 3, he proceeds to show us that Jesus is greater in glory than Moses. Now, the theme of the entire book 
is summed up in the two verses found in the middle of chapter 3, verse 1. Those two words are, consider Jesus. Consider means to think about something by taking time to observe it carefully. Our, often, our problem as human beings, as dumb human beings, is that we don't take the time to consider Jesus as he is revealed in God's word. If you're familiar with the Old Testament story, Moses went up to the mountain and spent 40 days alone with God. And then he came down, his face shone with the glory of God that he had seen up there. But here's the thing. This is why Jesus is greater. Jesus came from heaven itself, from the pre very presence of God, to reveal God to us. In Luke chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus made this astonishing claim. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. Friends, what a statement. That came from Jesus himself. If you want to know the living God, you must ask the Son to reveal him to you. Because you cannot know either the Father or the Son apart from divine revelation. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Peter made this confession about Jesus' identity. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then afterwards, Jesus replied to Peter in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. See, you hear what Jesus is saying there? Again, what an astonishing claim there. No mere man could make such claims. After his resurrection, Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Let me read that last part again. This is what Jesus said. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Church, those three, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, are the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Those three are the, the, those are the three divisions of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the Psalms. So what Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that, that everything that was written about, about him there has to be fulfilled. They must be fulfilled. Thus, all scripture, all of it, it points to Jesus, who was sent by God's sovereign plan to reveal him and accomplish his will. This then means that Jesus isn't just greater than Moses, but he's also greater than all the other Old Testament prophets that we read about in those stories. But what about the Old Testament promises about the promised land and the Sabbath? Well, chapter 4. Well, in chapter 4, the author showed us that Jesus provides the eternal rest that Joshua couldn't provide. As we saw in that chapter, it's not talking about experiencing inner peace 
or rest in the midst of trials. Rather, the author's concern was that his readers, like many in Israel and in the wilderness, would be associated with God's people, but will miss God's salvation because of their unbelief. So the writer showed that salvation has always been offered to God's people under the imagery of rest. See, the point is that only Christ can provide true rest for our souls when we rest from our works and trust in his work completely. Let me repeat that. Christ can provide true rest for our souls when we rest from our works and trust in his work completely. As Jesus promised in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, in a similar way, the author concludes chapter 4 by telling us that Jesus is our high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Again, in chapter 4, verse 16, he invites us, he invites you to approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, in the first four chapters, the author extols the glorious person of Jesus Christ. And after this, in chapters 5 to chapter 10, verse 18, he showed us why we should ask God to reveal to us Christ in his glorious priesthood. Now, did you know? Did you know that Hebrews is the only book in the Bible that presents Jesus Christ as our high priest? Sadly, a lot of Christians today tend to find this extended version or this extended um, theme or this extended section of Hebrews rather boring and irrelevant. But if you want to know the significance of this central theme in Hebrews, the priesthood of Christ, you must God, ask God for a clear understanding of his absolute holiness and majesty. Also, while you're at it, ask him for a deeper insight into your own sinfulness apart from Christ. See, when you do this, it'll lead you into a deeper appreciation of what Jesus did for you on the cross as the high priest who entered the holy place, not with the blood of animals, but with his own blood. And once again, I can't get into all the details here because it'll take up the majority of the time, but again, I refer you to that message I gave in Hebrews chapter Nine, eight, nine, um, nine. A deeper appreciation of God's holiness, your own sinfulness, and the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice is one of the most practical doctrines in the Bible. You know why? Because it humbles your pride. Pride, my friends, is the root of of every relational conflict and just about any sin you can name. Think of any sin. Think of any sin and you'll see that pride is at the root. So, my friends, ask God to reveal to you, ask God to reveal to your heart Jesus Christ, 
in his glorious priesthood. Now again, because there's so much information in those chapters, I'll only cover some of the broad themes of this section. One of those themes is in chapters 5 through 7, where we're told that Jesus, our high priest, is superior to Aaron and his priesthood. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, he shows that Jesus is the kind of high priest that every sinner needs. Every sinner needs. From uh, chapter 5, 11 through chapter 6, the author exhorts his readers to press on to maturity. After the severe warning of chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, he comforts them with the assurance that he that he is convinced of better things concerning them, namely things that accompany salvation. He points to Jesus in chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, as the anchor for our souls, the forerunner who has entered beyond the veil as our high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. If you haven't been with us, you haven't seen any of the messages, again, it's going to sound weird, but if you do a study there of Hebrews chapter 6, you'll, or hear the message, it'll make a lot more sense. Again, this is just a review of what we covered. Chapter 7 is an explanation of why Jesus, as priest after the order of Melchizedek, is superior to the Aaronic priests. See, through him, we can draw near to God. Through Jesus, we can draw near to God and be assured of our salvation. The other theme is found, another theme is found in chapter 8 through uh, chapter 10, verse 18, where we're informed that Jesus, our high priest, is superior to the old covenant. Now, because of time, I'll only give you a bare-bone summary of this important section. In chapter 8, we're told that Jesus offers better promises than the Old Covenant. In the first half of chapter 9, we see that Jesus offers a better tabernacle than the Old Covenant did. And in the second half of that chapter, all the way to verse 18 of chapter 10, the author tells us how Jesus offers a better sacrifice than the Old Covenant did. Now in the final section of the book, it shows us how we should apply these great truths about Christ's glorious person and priesthood. From, verses, from chapter 10, verse 19, all the way to the end of chapter 13, we learn that by seeing the glory of Christ in his person and priesthood, it's going to strengthen us to endure trials by faith. After the severe warning at the end of chapter 10, chapter 11 points us to those who endured by faith. Looking ahead to God's promises in Christ, which we have received. The author then exhorts us in the beginning of chapter 12 to submit to God's discipline, which he brings so that we will share in his holiness. And then he concluded that chapter by contrasting God's revelation at Mount Sinai with the glorious kingdom of Mount Zion, which we receive by coming to Jesus and the new covenant in his blood. Therefore, as chapter 13, verse 14 tells us, we must endure by faith, even if it means suffering and reproach, because we're seeking that heavenly city that is to come. And so the message of Hebrews is that the way to endure any kind of severe trial is to see the glory of Christ in his matchless person 
and His glory as our high priest. So my prayer is that you will heed the word of exhortation that's in this letter. May you fully grasp the message of the exalted Christ who dies for your sins and lovingly embraces you in the new covenant. May you consider him, fixing your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. May you heed the warnings and exalt the promises of this book, following the good examples such as Abraham and Moses and avoiding the errors of the bad. And may you receive an inheritance with the saints in the heavenly Jerusalem as we worship the angels, as we worship with the angels in joyful assembly. In the words of Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. And may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, before I begin to start closing here, I know this is, again, a short message this week. I want to share with you an invocation that was given by a pastor a while ago. Now, an invocation is uh, usually, again, it's, it's the beginning of a, it's a blessing in the beginning of a service, um, usually in prayer or a, a short speech. Um, but uh, this was an invocation given by a pastor. Now, I don't really know him personally. I don't know who he is. But as you will soon hear, he can certainly preach Christ. Also, considering the fact that just yesterday, uh, our well, a new earthly king was just cra- crowned across the Atlantic. It's kind of relevant. You'll see what I mean in just a second. And well, this is what that pastor said. The Bible says, my king is a, seven, is a seven-way king. He is the king of the Jews. That is a racial thing. He is the king of Israel. That's a national, that's a national king. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. Well, I wonder, do you know him? David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure, measure can define his limit, limitless love. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's, he's eternally steadfast. He's immortally immortally graceful. He's imperially, imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He is God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's August. He's August and he's unique. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. Unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He is the highest personality in philosophy. In philosophy. He is a supreme problem in higher criticism. He is the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He is the miracle of the age. He is the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. 
He's the only one who's qualified to be all sufficient Savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. The captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder, do you know him? Well, my king, he is a key. He had, he's the key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Almost done here. Well, his office is manifold. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yeah, but he is indescribable. Yes, he is. Good God, he's indescribable. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him out of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate found, couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah, that's my king. And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and when you get through with all the forevers, then, amen. Do you see what he's saying? Do you see how powerful Jesus is? How wonderful and good he is? He is everything that you need in this life. Nothing at all out there. No drug, no drink. No woman, no, will ever match him. You can come to him and he will accept you. He will love you. He will care for you. And he will forgive you of all your sins, regardless of how bad it was or how bad it is. Now, yes, there are consequences that may come as a result of those sins. But you know what? That doesn't compare at all to the forgiveness that he gives you, that he offers you, and that he gives you. If you're just willing to accept it. Ladies and gentlemen, this book of Hebrews, it all points to him. The entire Bible, it all points to Jesus. The writer here wants to show you how glorious and wonderful he is, not just as our Savior, but also as our high priest. And when he died, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies and everything else was torn into two. And whereas, well, whereas before only the high priest was able to go into the Holy of Holies once a year and with blood, 
Well, as a result of his death, now we're made holy and we can come into the holy of holies directly to God because of what Jesus did on the cross. I urge you, my friends, to go through this book again on your own time. Find a good commentary. Find a good sermon series. If you got nothing out of mine, there are plenty out there that are just as good and just as concise. And find more of the wonderful truths that I wasn't able to cover as we went through this letter. I now want to take the time to invite those who are maybe here, who are maybe watching and listening to this message, whether it's live or later on. I want to give you an opportunity to come to the cross, to come to Jesus and bear yourself before him. Open your heart to him and allow him to make his home in you. To cleanse you of all your sins. To free you from the shackles of sin and death. So if you're ready to be forgiven. If you're ready to come before Jesus. And make him the Lord of your life. I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus. To accept Jesus and be saved. Close your eyes and bow your head and pray this. Lord Jesus, I know and I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you now to forgive me of my sins. I believe truly that you died for my sins and rose from the dead three days later. And I repent of my sins. I turn away from them and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you truly prayed that, well, I want to be the first to welcome you to the family of God this journey, this life, this marathon that this book, as this book describes it, it's going to have its challenges. It's going to be difficult. It ain't always going to be easy. But he's going to be with you. The Lord Jesus is going to be with you the entire way. And the more you walk with him, the more you're, you stand beside him, the more he's going to reveal to you God's glory, God's beauty, God's grace. That will conclude today's message for those watching online. I hope you have a great week. I hope you're blessed. Please, again, reach out if you, have, you want to talk about anything. Um, man, so look forward to hearing from you and, and, and you joining us again. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.